you can say, I'm sorry, you're not my master. I have my marching orders already. I know who my master is. I had a very interesting story take place this Shabbos. So Shabbos morning, I came out of my room, I went into the living room, and I found sitting on my desk was one of my favorite books. Now this book had not been read in over a year, it was packed away in a bookshelf, and somehow it made its way to my desk. I had no clue how it got there, so I asked my family, and nobody had any idea. Now to make things even more interesting, my two children who could have reached that bookshelf and theoretically brought it to my desk, they weren't even home for Shabbos. So I really have no idea how this book got there. But this book was exactly what I needed to read over Shabbos. So what is this book? I want to talk about it and use it as a springboard for discussion about current events inside of the world. So the book is called Lodestone by Rabbi Mendel Edelman. He is a brilliant writer. It's like eating candy. Just everything is so delicious, so sweet. It's, it's a very, very easy to understand writing style, but the ideas are explosive. Every single page, it's just like your brain is just woo. I don't know how to describe it. It's just an amazing, amazing book. So what does he talk about inside of this book? He goes in a few different directions, but one of the first things that he speaks about is that the seven Noahide laws or the seven universal commandments of all of mankind are hardwired into us. And he brings, for example, people on the very far ends of society, people who are psychopaths like Jeffrey Dahmer, they are the anomaly. They are not the typical human being. A psychopath is incapable of feeling emotion. They can mimic emotions that they see other people presenting, but it's very shallow. They're just incapable of feeling it. Then on the opposite end of the society, you might have somebody with a chromosome abnormality that makes them where they can't feel any negative feelings towards another human being. Most people do not fall on these extreme ends of society. Most of us fall somewhere in the middle. If we're more narcissistic, we go towards a psychopath end, but we can still feel emotions, even if we can't necessarily understand other human beings and process them and care for them in the way that we should. Or we can tend towards the more empathetic side where we feel very strongly for other human beings' emotions. There's a broad spectrum. Everybody falls somewhere in between. Now, if this theory is correct, that everybody aside from the anomalies of society understand intuitively that we're not supposed to murder, we're not supposed to steal, we're not supposed to sleep with other people's spouses, we're not supposed to torture animals, and so on and so forth. We have to ask the question, how is it possible that somebody can actually go and do this? Because we see it's not a perfect world. People are doing these things, and some people don't even feel guilty about it. So the question is, is how, right? It's a good question. So he's going to bring the idea that a person can rationally override these innate feelings, their innate moral compass, when they have a good reason to do so, right? When the benefit is enough for them. And as an example, he brings the writers of the Declaration of Independence who proclaim that all men are created equal and people are allowed their freedom. And yet these very same writers of the Declaration of Independence, most of them own slaves. How, how is this reconcilable? The dissonance is unbelievable. You're saying people are free and you're having slaves? Where does that come in? So here's the thing. In that generation, there was all kinds of pseudoscience. They studied African-Americans and they said, their brain capacity is less than that of whites. They are subhuman. And once they were no longer considered on the same level as whites in terms of their humanness, well, then we can rationalize away that they don't belong being free men. They're not the same as white people. It's crazy, right? But when a person really wants to believe that what they're doing is okay, they can come up with all kinds of excuses. Same thing with torturing animals. There was a lot of people who actually tortured animals for fun. They had public cat burnings. I believe it was in the 1800s. Why? Because there was a scientist who pushed the theory that animals are automatons. They don't really feel pain. They just kind of react because it's instinctual, but it's not real pain. Of course, we have science now that disproves this theory, but entire generations of people desensitize themselves to watching animal suffering because they did not want to believe it. They rationalized it away. We can ask the same question about genocide, right? Nazi Germany, how could you go and just slaughter human beings? How is that possible? And it's very interesting that Nazi Germany was a very advanced society when it came to animal rights. Animals had rights in Germany, and that's a great thing. That's a progression towards goodness. And yet, you take human beings and you put them into crematoria, 
You take human beings and you just slaughter them left and right? How? How is that possible? So again, rationalization. If somebody wants to rationalize something, they can use their mind to override their moral compass, right? So how do the Nazis do it? The Nazis, they couldn't equate human life, sorry, Jewish life, on the same level as animal life. So what they had to do was equate us with vermin. It's perfectly okay to kill cockroaches and spiders, right? So therefore, it is okay to kill a Jew. That's the way it worked with Nazi propaganda. You see, the mind is a very, very powerful thing, and we can rationalize anything we want to. It doesn't change the fact that our innate moral compass tells us what is right and what is wrong. We're just not always tuned into it. And I would posit to you that we are living in a generation in which there's mass manipulation going on, a mass rationalization of many different things. So I wanna to explain to you how a person can override their own or somebody else's or even the society's moral compass. How is this possible? What is the process? So I'm gonna give you a step-by-step -step tried and true method that generally works, but I'm also going to give you two ways that we can avoid this trap of falling into a manipulation of our moral compass, all right? So what is the first step if you want to influence somebody to change their innate moral compass, to change their belief system, to do things that they normally would not do, right? The very first thing is you're going to identify your target. You're going to say who is malleable, right? It's generally going to be somebody or a group of people who don't have a voice. They don't have a strong sense of self. They are vulnerable, right? Once the target has been identified, and I would posit that in our society, it is our children who are the targets. Once the target has been identified, then you're going to do something called building report. You are going to make that person feel very comfortable with you, or that society. You're going to make that society feel very comfortable with you. You're going to do this by creating a sense of likeness, right? Everybody is part of a same societal structure. Everybody has a same schedule. Everybody follows the same teachings, right? Something that binds them together. I am like you in a certain way. Then you're going to feed them information. And when you start feeding them information, you're going to give them information that is true and verifiable and does not grate against their moral compass, right? I would say that this takes place in our educational institutions. Right? We have children who are very malleable. We are feeding them very, very basic, easily digestible information when they first start out. This is the color blue. The sky is blue. And then when the target has been sufficiently primed, as we call it, then we're going to move into leading. Leading is when you start taking them towards the ideas that you want them to absorb that may not sit well with their moral compass, but they've already developed rapport with you. They already began to trust you. So once they have rapport, then at that point in time, then you can begin suggesting to them information that doesn't necessarily sit right to a person who has not been primed, okay? We have all kinds of crazy educations going on inside of our classrooms right now. I'm not going to trigger the YouTube system over here. I'm not going to spell it out directly, but we have the pride movement. We have all the craziness that's going on campus now. You know, people are screaming for genocide. A lot of craziness that should not feel right for the average human being. But here's the thing. These people have been primed. They have been primed since they were small children inside of the educational system. Now, once a person has been sufficiently primed, they have been led, they have had ideas implanted inside of their mind, then you can actually move to embedding commands. An embedded command means that you are putting forth marching orders, right? But you're doing it subtly. You're telling them that this is what is going to be expected of you. Eventually you go to full blown, this is what I expect of you, all right? It's a process. 
It's a process that has been sufficiently done with our children all across the country, and I would say all across the world, leading up to this moment in time. We did not end up in the situation that we are today from one second to the next. This has been a priming process getting us to this point. Now, what possibly is the way to save yourself from falling into a manipulative system? So there are two things that I would posit to you. Number one, awareness. Awareness of the steps of what's happening. If you're aware of it, you can follow this manipulative process unfolding before your eyes. But awareness is not always enough to stop you from being led in a direction that you don't wanna go. Why? Because our rational mind, as we mentioned already, can override our intuitive feelings if there is benefit. Now, that benefit can be an emotional feeling. It, it can be a sense of, I have community. I have love. I have admiration. I have respect. I am learning something. I have a group. And that's why we can see people all across college campuses. They're generally the misfits of society. They're the people who are like, I didn't have a place to go otherwise. I have nobody who showed me love. All of a sudden I had this radical group and because they embraced me, well, I'm ready to follow through with whatever they tell me. You know, if <laughs> you get people chanting things that they don't even understand, they have no clue what river, no clue what sea, but they're part of something. So for them, they don't care if there was an awareness, they don't care what they're getting involved in. As long as the benefit outweighs whatever they would lose by departing from that group. So awareness is not always a solution. So if you have been primed by somebody, you have been led by somebody, by an entity or by a person, what is ultimately the thing that could save a person? It's called having a value. And it has to be a very strong value. Rabbi Mendel Edelman is going to make the claim that if the Noahide laws are not divine, then there's no guarantee that we're actually going to follow them because we can rationalize anything away. If the benefit is greater than our internal compass, then it can be rationalized away. But here's the thing. If the law is divine, if you say, I know who my master is, I know what my commandment is, then there is no way in the world to rationalize it away. You have your marching orders. So when somebody else comes along and they're giving you ideas that go contrary to what you're supposed to be doing, you can say, I'm sorry, you're not my master. I have my marching orders already. I know who my master is. That is the only thing that can totally save us from being manipulated by a person or by an entity. So let's think about this logically. Even if a person or a group of people have been through the educational system and it's been a particularly pathetic one that has led them towards insane ideas, or a person has been primed by a manipulator of some sort, they're going to have this moment of truth, this moment where they have to stop and they have to decide if they're going to be a sheeple or if they're going to be a soldier. At the moment that they wake up and they say, hold on, I have a value and my value is not congruent with what is being told to me, then I have to choose. Am I going to follow the new master or am I going to follow the divine master? Am I going to follow the creator of the world? Am I going to follow the value, the real value? Or am I going to give it up for the rationalizations? Am I going to give it up for what I know instinctively is wrong? That's what it all boils down to. Now, for people who have been raised in the public school system, there are certainly people who came out of it healthy and well. But as we see, the public school system is definitely going off the far end. And they are embedding ideas. They are implanting very non-holy ideas into our children. We have to ask the question, what is a solution? Now, I can't give the solution for everybody. Everybody has their own unique story, their own unique living situation. I can say that, generally speaking, Jewish children should be in Jewish schools. So if you have a local Jewish school near you, an Orthodox school where they can learn about the Torah, please consider taking your child out of public school and sending them to a private Orthodox school so they go and learn what the Torah actually is. Make sure it's a good school, a loving school, a school where the child is going to be safe. But that is definitely the best path for a Jewish child. What about a Noahide, a non-Jewish child who also wants to serve the creator of the world? Here's the thing, I don't think there are any Noahide schools in the world. The question is, what can you do about it? If you are Noahide, can you make Noahide curriculum? Can you create a boarding school for Noahide kids? Can you change the school system that you're currently in? Can you work on getting better curriculum put into the class? What can you do to make the situation in the world better? 
right? How can we tip the balance? We have to learn how to think outside the box. We have to learn to ask the question, what can I do for Hashem? How can I be a soldier? Because that's really the only choice that we have. Am I going to be a sheeple or am I going to be a soldier? Let's all choose wisely.